In this video, we are going to talk about the serviceability limit state for reinforced concrete structures. In last videos, we have talked about the ultimate limit state for the reinforced concrete structures. Ultimate limit state can be uh, flexure failure or shear failure or failure in compression or tension. So whenever a structure exceeds the ultimate limit state, the structure will fail. The ultimate limit state is about the failure of the structure. However, the serviceable limit state, on the other hand, is about the day-to-day -day use of the structure and to make sure that the structure remains functional for when it is subjected to a normal serviceable load. So at serviceable limit state, the structure hasn't yielded yet. So it is before the structure yields and it is about the day-to-day -day use of the structure, how the structure perform during the day-to-day -day use of the structure. Uh, these are the three serviceable limit state that we need to consider for the structures. And one is excessive crack width, to make sure that the crack widths are not excessive, to make sure that there is no excessive deflection in the structure or there is no undesirable vibration in the structure. Especially for the concrete structure, we are mostly concerned with the excessive crack widths and excessive deflection. So we'll be focusing on these two serviceable limit state. The first serviceable limit state is deflection. We have to make sure that the reinforced concrete structure do not deflect too much so as to cause discomfort to the occupants or causing sagging of the floors or uh, resulting in the poor fitting of uh, doors and windows. So excessive deflection can have all these effects like sagging of the floors, poor fitting of the doors and windows, uh, damaging the partition walls or causing dis discomfort to the occupants. So we need to limit the deflection that happens in a reinforced concrete structures. And the best way to um, increase the resistance to deflection or to reduce the deflection is to increase the depth of the beam. So for example, so if this is our beam, the moment of inertia of this beam is I equals to BD cube by 2L. So if moment of inertia is higher, it has a more resistance against deflection, it is more stiffer. So to increase the moment of inertia, the best way to increase the moment of inertia is to increase the depth of the beam because it is cubed. If we increase the width of the beam, it doesn't have that much effect on the moment of inertia. But if we increase the depth of the beam, it has more effect. So the best way to reduce the deflection is to increase the depth of the beam. Uh, so most of the design codes limit the deflection by specifying either the minimum depth required for the beams or slabs or maximum permissible deflection. So the code will either um, specify the minimum depth required or it will specify what is the maximum deflection allowed and you calculate the deflection for that structure and make sure that it is within the limit. So as you can see in table 2.3.2 in AS3600, it gives us the maximum permissible deflection for different um, beams and slabs. Uh, for example, if it is a simply supported beam, like this, and your maximum deflection is at, of course at the center here, and that is denoted by delta, um, and L effective is the span of the beam, L effective. So the table 2.3.2 says that the maximum deflection delta over L effective should be less than or equal to 1 over 250. So the deflection, maximum deflection allowed delta over L effective is less than 1, 1 over 250. And now if it is a cantilever beam, the maximum deflection is of course at the free end delta so that delta over L effective for a cantilever beam where L effective is should be less than or equal to 1 over 125 as you see here so that gives us the maximum allowable deflection in different members now if there are partition walls on top of um, these structures uh, the maximum deflection limit is more stringent. For example, now, if the, if the members are supporting a masonry partition walls, um, the deflection limit is more stringent, and you, so you can allow only 1 over 500 delta uh, over L effective. Whereas for cantilever, it is delta over L effective is limited to 1 over 250. And similarly, if it, is, it, it has some brittle finishes, 
then it is again stringent uh, for both um, simply supported and cantilever beams as well. So what we do is we calculate the, the total deflection for the beam and we have to make sure that that deflection is within the maximum deflection allowed. Now to calculate the deflection, we, the deflection has two parts. Um, one is short term deflection and another one is long term deflection. The deflection that occurs immediately in the member after the load is applied to it is called as a short term deflection. It is basically an elastic deformation that happens in the structure when the load is being applied. And the long term deflection is the short term deflection plus the deflection caused by creep and shrinkage with time. As you know, in concrete structure, creep and shrinkage causes increase in deflection over the time. So for the long term deflection, you have to add the short term deflection you calculate for the elastic deformation and plus the creep and shrinkage deflection that is caused because of the creep and shrinkage. And both the short term deflection and the long term deflection should be less than the maximum deflection allowed as shown in table 2.3.2. Now, first to calculate the short-term deflection, clause 8.5.3.1 gives us a simplified method to calculate the short-term deflection. So, we are using elastic analysis for the short-term deflection because it is the immediate deflection, el elastic deformation that happens as soon as the load is being applied. So, the structure is still in the elastic region. So, it is. But, however, we need to consider the cracking in the beam and the change in the effective moment of inertia because of the cracking in the beam has to be considered to calculate the short-term deflection. And in here, uh, the EC stands for the Young's modulus of the concrete, which can be obtained from clause 3.1.2. So once you find the Young's modulus of concrete and the effective moment of inertia, which is I effective, this is called as the then you can find the elastic deflection for the beam. Uh, using the elastic analysis so for different um, support conditions you can see the maximum deflections in the beam so for example if it is simply supported beam supporting a uniformly distributed load the maximum deflection at the center as we discussed earlier delta s s is given by this equation now for the fixed uh, support with the uniformly distributed load maximum deflection is still at the um, mid span and this delta S is given by this equation. And for the cantilever, as we discussed earlier, the maximum deflection is at the free end. And delta S is given by this equation. So if it is a point load, uh, you can find the maximum deflection at the mid span. Um, and again, if it is cantilever beam uh, with the load point load at the uh, free end, you can find the maximum deflection at the free end using this equation. So once you calculate this short short term deflection using the elastic analysis, you have to make sure that this is less than the maximum deflection allowed according to table 2.3.2. Now to calculate the short term deflection, we need to calculate the effective moment of inertia. We need to do that because the concrete section is cracked. If the concrete beam was not cracked, the moment of inertia for the whole beam will be I. So if it is a rectangular section and if the beam hasn't cracked, your moment of inertia throughout the beam length would be BD cube over 2L. However, as we increase the load in the beam, the concrete in the tension side would crack. So once the concrete has cracked, it doesn't have the full moment of inertia. So we have to calculate the crack moment of inertia for the section where the concrete has cracked. But there are other sections in the beam where there are no cracks and it still have the full moment of inertia BD cubed by 12. So we have to calculate I, I effective to take into account that some section of the beam have already cracked and some section of the beam hasn't cracked yet. So let's see how to calculate the effective moment of inertia for the cracked section of the beam. Now clause 8.5.3.1 in AS3600 gives us the equation for calculating the effective moment of inertia for the beam where some section of the beam has already cracked and some section hasn't cracked yet. As you can see, I effective or the effective moment of inertia is computed um, using this equation. In here, uh, I is the gross moment of inertia. Um, so that is BDQ by 12. It is a rectangular section. And um, I crack is the moment of inertia for the crack section. We'll see how to find I crack here. Uh, 
M MCRT is a cracking moment. That means uh, we need to find out at what moment the beam will crack. We know how to find the cracking moment. Um, and this I effective has to be greater than the effective maximum moment of inertia allowed that is given by this equation. So you can find the effective moment of inertia using this equation. Now, one another parameter in this equation is M star S. M star S is the maximum moment in a member when is subjected to the short-term loading. So if your beam is subject to short-term loading, what is the maximum moment in the member? That is your M star S. So with this, you can find effective moment of inertia using clause 8.5.3.1. But to do that, you need to find the crack moment of inertia first. So let's see how we can find I crack, ICR. Now, again, as I said, if it was on crack section, your moment of inertia for the rectangular sections with width B and depth D would be BD cubed by 12. But if but the reinforced concrete beam would have cracked, um, so uh, your section would be something like this. And as soon as the concrete cracks, the steel will come into picture and the concrete below the neutral axis you can neglect it so there so this is a neutral axis and the cr concrete has cracked so you can neglect the concrete below the neutral axis so for the crack section it will look something like this one this is the on crack section in compression which is the width is b and the concrete section below the neutral axis can be neglected because it is already cracked and uh, we are only using the steel here. Now the area of the steel in tension is AST. Now to convert into the equivalent area in terms of concrete, we multiply with N here, where N is the ratio of Young's mod modulus of steel by Young's modulus of concrete. Now, we need to find what is your neutral axis depth x uh, for this uh, crack section. And we can do that by taking the moment of area about the neutral axis. So for, for the, uh, the on crack concrete section, it is bx is area multiplied by x by 2. That means the moment of area should be equal to the area of the steel, transform area of the steel NAST multiplied by the distance from the neutral axis is D minus X. So solving this equation will give us what is the depth of neutral axis X. Now once you find X, you can find the crack moment of inertia. Moment of inertia of this um, rectangular block, compression block about the neutral axis here is B X cube over 3 that is the moment of inertia of this section about the base of the rectangular section is bx cubed by 3 plus and we have to find the moment of inertia of the steel about the neutral axis as well um, because the diameter of the steel is very small we neglect the moment of inertia of the steel about its own axis so we neglect that then we just have to transform it into the neutral axis here so that means it is the area of the steel in AST multiplied by the distance square that is D minus X square. So that will give the moment of inertia of this crack section. So once you find I crack, you have to, you have to substitute va this value into the equation for I effective and you can f calculate your I effective. Once you find the I effective, then find the elastic deflection for the beam and make sure that it is smaller than the allowed maximum deflection in the beam. So after finding the short-term deflection, you also have to find the long-term deflection in the concrete beam, which takes into account the extra deflection that is caused due to the creep and shrinkage in the concrete uh, section as well. So creep and shrinkage causes extra deflection over the time, and you have to add that one to your short-term deflection as well. So as shown in this figure, so at time zero, time t equals to zero, when you apply the load, this is the short-term deflection that happened immediately when you apply the load, when t equals to zero. Now you are keeping the load constant, but over the years, the deflection in the beam gradually increases over time. As you can see, at uh, at certain uh, time, your total deflection is greater than your short-term deflection that you have, delta S. And in fact, the total deflection is the short-term deflection plus the creep and shrinkage deflection. So 
this part is the So you need to find out what is the creep and shrinkage deflection and add it to the short term deflection and calculate the long term deflection over the time. So therefore, according to clause 8.5.3.2, the total deflection in the beam over time is the, is the combination of the short term deflection, that is the elastic deflection, plus the deflection caused by creep and shrinkage in the beam. Now the KCS is the creep and shrinkage factor here and it is given in the clause 8.5.3.2 as shown here. So it depends on the area of the reinforcement in compression as well as the area of reinforcement in tension. So in this equation, AST is of course the area of reinforcement in tension and ASC is your area of reinforcement in compression. So KSC as you can see depends on the ratio of ASC over AST. Now what it means is that if you if you provide compression reinforcement it reduces the creep stresses in the concrete compression block and also it will reduce your uh, deflection due to the creep and shrinkage as well. So the more the compression steel you have the lesser the creep and shrinkage stress in the beam and hence the lesser the deflection you have for creep and shrinkage. And now to calculate the service load acting on the beam. Uh, to calculate some short term and the long term deflection. Um, for example, if it is a simply supported beam with the dead load of G and the live load of Q, show the short term load acting on the beam is the dead load plus the live load Q and we need to use the short term factor called as Gi S and it is, that is the short term service heavily load factor and if it is a long term load that means it is the load is acting for a long time it is a dead load plus live load Q with the long term service heavily load factor which is called as Gi L and Gi S and Gi L this long term and short term load factors are given in um, AS 1170.0 in uh, table 4.2 if you can look at it it gives us uh, the short term and the long term load factors for different floor structures now that is one way of making sure that your deflection satisfied the maximum deflection limit that means you calculate the, the actual deflection short term deflection and the long term deflection and make sure that the deflection that you calculate is within the maximum deflection allowed in the code that is one way of doing it and the second way is to use the deem to comply span to def ratio as shown here in clause 8.5.4. Now if you select the def of the beam or slab according to this equation, if it satisfies this equation, the code says that your deflection will be within the limit. So either you have to calculate the deflection and make sure that it is within the limit or you satisfy this deem to comply span to def ratio which takes into account that it already satisfies the deflection limit. So in here L effective is the effective span of the beam and D is your uh, effective depth of the beam and you have to find your D based on this equation so that uh, it already satisfies the, the maximum deflection limit given in your equation. So we'll see this uh, example when finding the depth of the slab using deemed to comply span to depth ratio. Another important service level limit state for reinforced concrete beam is cracking. So we have to make sure that the cracks in the beams are within the limit. Otherwise, it can cause visual issues. Uh, it doesn't look good. And also, um, the water and chloride ion can ingress through the cracks and causing the uh, corrosion of the reinforcement and, and, and resulting in the structural issues as well. So we have to make sure that the cracks in the beams are within the limit. So there are three different ways of uh, making sure that the cracks are within the limit. The first a very simple way of making sure that the cracks are within the limit according to clause 8.6.1. So this clause can be used when the beam is fully enclosed within the building. So what are the conditions that we have to satisfy are uh, given in clause 8.6.1. What it says is that the tensile zone in the beam has reinforcement greater than the minimum reinforcement prescribed in 8.1.6.1. That means the area of steel that you provided for the beam should be greater than the minimum reinforcement required which is given in 8 point clause 
8.1.6.12. So if the if the reinforcement that you provide is greater than the minimum reinforcement mentioned there, you, you get the tick for this one. The second one is the distance from side or soffit of the beam to the center of the nearest reinforcement should not be greater than 100 millimeter. That means the distance from the base of the beam to the center of the reinforcement shouldn't be greater than 100 millimeter. Similarly, from the side of the beam to the center of the beam shouldn't be greater than 100 millimeter as well. If that's satisfied, this is met as well. And also bars with the diameter less than half the diameter of the largest bar should be ignored while calculating the moment capacity. So if it, you have a combination of um, different diameter bars and and some bars diameter are less than half the diameter of the biggest bar, you will ignore those bars while calculating the moment capacity. So if you did that, that ticks the box as well. And the center to center spacing of the bars in the tension phase should not be greater than 300 millimeter. That means the distance from one bar to another bar center to center should not be greater than 300 millimeter as well. So for example, instead of providing two 28 millimeter bars, where it might result in the distance between this one is greater than 300 millimeter. You might want to provide, say, 3 in 20 bars, reducing the distance between these bars less than 300 millimeter. So that makes sure that there are no cracks happening between the bars as well. And also for the T-beams and L-beams, the reinforcement required in the flanes shall be distributed across the effective width. That means if it is a T-beam like this, The reinforcement here in tension should be distributed across the flange. So it is not, not in the wave only, but in it should be distributed across the flange. So that will prevent the crack as well. Now you can use this clause uh, only when the beam is fully enclosed, except it is exposed very short time during the construction only. But if the beam has different exposure condition, then you can use these two methods to ensure that the crack width is within the limit. The first one is you calculate the tensile stress in the steel and make sure that it is less than the tensile stress given in these two tables, 8.6.2.2a and b. So you are calculating the tensile stress in the steel and making sure that the tensile stress are smaller than these values given here. And the second method is more rigorous method where we you actually calculate the crack width of the uh, given section and making sure that it is less than whatever prescribed for the design. So looking at the first method, so we actually calculate the stress in the tensile steel which is written as sigma SCR. So this sigma SCR should be less than given in these two tables. So for example, if we are using a, a N20 bars, so 20 millimeter bars, and if your design criteria require that the crack width shouldn't be greater than say 0.3 millimeter so this is the crack width maximum crack width allowed from from the design that means the crack uh, for the for the particular purpose of the structure if the crack width shouldn't be greater than 0.3 millimeter then that means the tensile stress in the steel sigma scr should be less than 195 megapascal so to ensure that the crack width remains less than 0.3 millimeter, you have to ensure that the stress in the steel sigma SCR is less than this one. And also uh, to take into account the spacing between the bars, um, for say, for example, if the bar spacing is 150 millimeter and your uh, maximum crack width requires 0.3 millimeter, the tensile stress in the bar shouldn't be greater than 245 megapascal. So what it means is that from table 8.6.2.2 A and B, find out what is the maximum tensile stress allowed in the steel and your steel stress, what you calculate should be less than that one. So bigger of these two values from the, these two tables and you calculate the stress in your tensile steel and that should be less than this, uh, this value from here. And alternative method and the second method, as I said before, is to calculate the actual crack width in the section and making sure that it is according to 8.6.2.3. So we'll be using uh, the first two methods uh, to make sure that the crack width remain within the limit.